Uh, hello everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Mohamed Uliol. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some work we did at the University of Michigan uh, in distributing data across data centers and how consistency forces trade-offs between latency and cost. So uh, let's pretend for a moment that um, we have this awesome idea for an NSDI paper and we want to start writing the text for it. Um, Harsha is over in India spending some time with his family uh, while I'm in the US and we want to start working on the text. And for this we use Overleaf which is like Google Docs but for uh, LaTeX documents. So to provide low latency, initially when we send a request, this should hit some nearby web server. So this will ensure that uh, each of us um, has low latency when we're accessing the website. But eventually the request is going to have to hit some shared storage service. And the reason for this is because we want to collaborate on the same document. Now if this is located in a single location, what's going to happen is if this data center fails, we can't access the data anymore, which would be unfortunate. Um, so we can introduce additional data sites which can ensure availability of the data even when that site goes down. But if we have these, we might as well try to use them to further improve latency. Um, and the challenge with doing this is that as soon as we introduce more than one copy of the data, we have to start thinking about consistency. And so uh, I'm going to be aiming to provide the neurizability here. Uh, and the neurizability is essentially presenting the illusion of one logical copy of the data where you always operate on the latest version of this data. Um, so this is a very nice guarantee to provide. However, it imposes trade-offs that cannot be avoided. And I'm going to discuss, in particular, the trade-off between read and write latency and also read latency and cost. So let's say that I'm going to execute a read. When I execute this read, I'm going to contact a minimum, minimum of two data sites to ensure that writes are available even during failures. And so this subset of the data sites that I'm contacting, I'm going to refer to as a quorum for the rest of this talk. This is my read quorum. Harsha, meanwhile, is going to try writing a new uh, version of the document, and he's going to talk to his, uh, a write quorum of the data sites. Notice that there's this point of intersection between the quorums. This overlap is what ensures that data will remain consistent. When he successfully writes a new version of the data, I'm guaranteed to see it because I am reading from one of the sites that he just wrote to. What we can do is try moving uh, this data center, that's data site that's in the overlap, somewhere that's closer to me. If we do this, then my read latency improves, but Harsha's write latency uh, gets, suffers. And so there's this fundamental tension between the read latency that I can observe and the write latency that Harsha can get. And there's a similar trade-off going the other way around. Now we have a new collaborator. He's located in New Zealand, and all of us are trying to read the data. So what happens? Each of us is going to contact a read quorum. However, these might consist of data sites that are very far away, especially for our new collaborator accessing sites that are all the way in Europe. We can improve read latency by introducing additional sites. Now the problem with doing this is that, well, so the benefit of doing this is that now everyone can talk to read quorum that's uh, close by and they can have low latency. But the problem with this is we've significantly increased the number of sites. We've actually doubled them. And so this means that we double our storage costs if we're using replication, and also we have to transfer much more data over the WAN, which is expensive. There's a similar trade-off between write latency and cost, and for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on storage to uh, simplify the discussion. So I mentioned that there's these different dimensions to the trade-off space. So we can think of this as having, uh, we can think of this problem as we have a storage overhead budget that we're willing to incur a rate latency budget that we're willing to incur. We can then consider all possible sets of data sites and any other configuration parameters, find which one will give us the lowest possible read latency given those two budgets. Then we can compute some trade-off curve in this three-dimensional space. As we increase our read lane, write latency budget, we expect read latency to improve. As we increase our storage overhead budget, we also expect read latency to improve. Anything closer to the origin is going to be better. Now the problem is that three-dimensional trade-offs are difficult to reason about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two slices of this space. First, I'm going to fix the storage overhead budget, and I'm going to vary the amount of write latency we're willing to incur. Secondly, I'm going to fix the write latency budget and vary the storage overhead budget that we are willing to incur. Compute, in both cases, what the lowest possible read latency is. Down and to the left is better for both figures. First, we look at ePaxos, which is a state-of-the-art uh, replication protocol for wide area networks. We can see that there is a trade-off between read latency and storage overhead. 
In particular, going from 3x storage to 9x storage allows us to cut latency into a third. However, uh, we can also see that there's a step pattern to latency, and this has to do with the fact that we can only store data at data centers. And so when we move from using one data center to another, that's when we see an improvement, and so that's why we see this step pattern. But just by looking at this, we can't gauge how good this is. And so what we do is we compare it with an estimate we make of a theoretical lower bound. We don't bound uh, this approach by any particular protocol. So for example, it's not using Paxos. Instead, we uh, simply use a quorum-based approach that only respects consistency and fault tolerance constraints that are necessary, um, but not necessarily sufficient to uh, achieve linearizability and fault tolerance. And so, in other words, this can perform better than any uh, possible approach. When we add the lower bound, we see that there is a gap between it and ePaxos. In particular, given a read latency target, ePaxos can suffer significant storage uh, overhead can also uh, sometimes not be able to close uh, in on the read latency that the lower bound can get. The fundamental problem with ePaxos is that it relies on replication. Whenever we want to introduce an additional data site, we have to incur the cost of storing another full copy of the data. OK, so we know that there's this thing called erasure coding. It's been used in lots of settings to lower cost. Can we use it here? For our purposes, what this means is that we can store the equivalent of one case of the data at each site. And k is simply a configurable parameter. It could mean half the data, a third of the data, and so on. Um, as long as we can get k splits of the data, we're able to recover the value. RS Paxos is a Paxos variant that operates on erasure coded data. Let's see how it performs. We see that, first of all, there is some utility in using RS Paxos. ePaxos has some minimum amount of storage overhead as it has to incur, just by nature of using replication. So RS Paxos is able to go lower than that. However, RS Paxos often has significant write latency and read latency overhead compared to ePaxos. And in fact, RS Paxos has two main limitations. The first is the fact that it executes writes in two rounds. ePaxos can do this in a single round, and so that explains the difference between that and ePaxos. But there's also a second limitation, which is the fact that between quorums, it has unnecessarily, unnecessarily large intersections, which prevents it from closing in on the lower bound. So what are we trying to do here? We started by saying we want to spread data across data centers, improve availability and latency. But uh, we noted that there are constraints imposing trade-offs on how well we can do in three dimensions, read, write, and storage. I showed that ePaxos falls short of uh, an optimal approach. And the reason for this is due to its use of replication. I also showed that simply using erasure coding means that uh, actually latency can get worse than when we use ePaxos. Pando, our approach, leverages erasure coding to get close to the lower bound um, and addresses both the limitations of RS Paxos. It still executes writes in two phases, but it can approximate the latency of a one round write protocol. So I'll start by explaining that, and then afterwards I'll explain this how we improve the intersection requirement. So I first have to do some Paxos review. This is going to take way too much time. So instead, I'm going to just defer you to other papers. Uh, and I'm going to talk just about what's necessary to hopefully understand our optimizations. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about the case where every request that we issue succeeds. So Paxos writes data in two phases. And the first phase is akin to uh, performing leader election. So what happens is the web server is going to uh, send messages to all of the data sites declaring itself leader. They're going to acknowledge this. Afterwards the web server is going to go about writing the data. So it's going to send out the right messages to execute the write, and then get the acknowledgments. In total, this takes 120 milliseconds in this example. A one round write protocol only needs to do the second phase. And so it can, uh, it, it can perform this in just 60, second, 60 milliseconds. So let me show you how we get close to this. We make two changes. The first change is we speed up the time it takes to execute phase one. And so it's been noted that for Paxos to execute correctly, we don't actually need phase one and phase two quorums to be the same. We can actually make phase one quorums uh, such that they only intersect with phase two quorums. They don't need to intersect with each other. And so we leverage this to make phase one quorums small. And the effect is that in phase one, we can execute it much more quickly. We contact fewer data sites, more local data sites. And uh, this t means that we can execute phase one in 20 milliseconds instead of 60. Phase two executes just as it did before. And so we've brought the write latency down from 120 milliseconds to 80 milliseconds. The second 
observation we make is that the latency cost of executing two phases actually stems from the fact that we're going from the front end back to the, uh, to the data sites, and then back, and then back, and then back again. And so what if we could keep the execution closer to the data sites? This observation has been used before to chain RPCs together, move the place where, move the location of where execution is done, and we use that to not execute phase two at the web server, but in fact execute it at a so-called delegate data site. So let me show you what I mean. We have our web server start just as it did before, declaring itself leader to the data sites. Now I've highlighted uh, our delegate data site here with the flag. When the acknowledgments are being sent out, rather than going to the web server, it instead goes to the delegate. The delegate then goes in about initiating the write. So it broadcasts the actual data, and this takes now less time than it did before. And finally, the acknowledgments come back to the web server. Combine these two optimizations, take write latency down to 65 milliseconds, which has less than 10% overhead compared to uh, one round write protocol. Neither of these optimizations are uh, new RPC chains known technique as is flexible Paxos. However, we observe that the combination of the two can get you close to one round write protocol. So that's how we up improve uh, write latency. The second thing is how we deal with this intersection requirement. When Paxos executes a write, it, broadcast, it takes the data and then it broadcasts writes to all of the data sites. Here we're using uh, erasure coding and we have k set to two, and so we store one, the equivalent of one half the data on each of the sites. Now we only wait for a quorum of these to succeed, and this has implications for reads. So here I've maintained the write quorum, and when we try to read the data, we're guaranteed k splits intersection between the read quorum that we're using and the write quorum that was used in phase two. So we're guaranteed that we'll have two splits of the data, which is what we do here, uh, and we also get one split of the older copy of the data in this scenario. But two splits is enough to recover the data, so we're fine. But this is really the rare case. In the common case, where conflicts are not occurring and neither are failures, what's actually going to happen is a new version of the data will be available on all of the sites. And so when we try to execute the read, we're going to, see, we're going to receive an unnecessary uh, number of splits for the, same, for the new version of the object. We'll be getting three when we only need two. So we use this observation as follows. We just start and see what happens when we try a one site intersection. When we do this, so we contact the two nearest sites. In the common case, this is enough. We have case splits. We can recover the value. We're done. But what happens in the rare case? In the rare case, we contact the two nearest sites. We only have one split. So this is not enough to recover the data. But what this does tell us is that a write may have completed. We're not entirely sure. And so what we do is we wait for the larger quorum that we were waiting for previously. So in the rare case, we will fall back on the case splits intersection. Whereas in the common case, we're able to have just the one, one split intersection and we have lower latency. So those are the two primary design points of Pando. We have additional things in the paper. Uh, we have a proof of correctness. Pando also bounds latency under conflict. So see the paper for those details. In our evaluation, we're primarily uh, asking the question, how close is Pando or any other approach to the lower bound? And we want to evaluate this across a range of scenarios. So for that, what we do is we vary the set of web servers that are going to be accessing the data. So one might exist in Northern Europe, one might exist in, uh, let's say, Eastern US, and that's going to be our access set. We're going to try many access sets, so we try 500. Given an access set, uh, we use a solver to determine what the best selection of data sites are, as well as any other configuration parameters, minimize latency given constraints on write and storage, and compute figures that look exactly like the ones I showed earlier. So this is for a single access set. There's the space between here, epaxos and the lower bound. The volume of this gap, remember this is a three-dimensional trade-off, that volume is the number I'm going to use to measure how close a particular approach is to the lower bound. So we observe that Pando is much closer to the lower bound than either epaxos or rspaxos. Looking at the median access set, the gap with rspaxos is 13 times higher. The gap with epaxos is 11 times higher than it is with Pando. And even if we combine the two in any particular scenario, considering which one would be better, we see that epaxos has, or the, EPA, the combination of epaxos and rspaxos has a significantly higher gap than Pando. There's still a gap between Pando and the lower bound. And uh, we see that most of this could be closed if we had a true one round write protocol. All of these numbers are based off latency estimates that we computed. Uh, when we ran Pando in a cloud deployment, we conf uh, confirmed that the latency estimates were reliable indicators of latency. We also saw significant cost savings when we considered other factors like um, compute and bandwidth costs. 
So to conclude, Pando is an approach for uh, ensuring linearizability when distributing data across data centers. It achieves a near optimal read latency, write latency storage trade-off by allowing for the use of erasure coding when needed and rethinking how to apply Paxos in a wide area setting. Thank you. Questions? So I have a question. Is like, have you um, uh, did like this in a case of study for the CDN, for example, or gaming and streaming? Because this is relies basically on latency. Yes. Whatever the negative latency that some companies speaking about in, in streaming and gaming, and it's all relying is like having the user closer, or actually the game closer to the user. Yeah, I, we haven't tried any um, particular like gaming applications, so I, I don't really know what the, the workload would be like. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, but I, I don't have an answer for that. Thank okay. you. Right. Thank you. Hi. Yes. I have another question. Um, are you suggesting Pando as a generalized improvement over Paxos, or is this for a particular case? So Pando does have some limitations. So the fact that it uses erasure coding means that we can't see the contents of the data. And so it's um, slightly difficult to use it, uh, for example, to have a transactional storage system, like a SQL type server. And so for those types of settings, uh, it might be difficult to support those workloads. Uh, for key value stores, it would work. Uh, okay. So we, we, we focus on the key value store setting. Uh, more general workloads, uh, yeah, it might, be, it might be difficult to support some of them. Perfect. I want to tell you all why you have made history, but first, let's, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker once again. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you.